if there are travel advisories it means that people can't come what how can the industry survive so yeah so that's what i'm saying i mean it's it's very difficult to survive it's like this now if you talk to the, the different countries they will say look we are not telling anybody not to go but then moment you who bring in a travel advisory saying that uh, only essential travel or there is a re- high risk or something like that then obviously like the, the insurance premiums would go up and things like that uh, on one side so so actually for the formal sector what we call the formal sector is like uh, the, like the dmcs hotels and all that which are registered with tourist board who bring in all our funds and blah blah all of that then you get the organically developed informal sector where you know people book through various platforms somebody has turned their house into a into a homestay or into a guest house and you know like typical if you look at places like uh, unavatuna all there is those are all places that have organically kind of developed into into informal into through the informal sector so now those people uh, people like that have no issues they they still come as long as the airport is open and there are flights uh, they will come to they do their own bookings and come so that way actually for the informal sector to some extent the uh, like if, now if you go to ella it's back with uh, tourists the thing is that, so so the smaller smaller guys in the industry they actually benefit from that whereas uh, for us it's tough so yeah so that's why now more, most of the time what we what we are always trying to do is um advisory is relaxed but similarly there are there are other ways of surviving because you take country like india middle east and all there are no advisory so that's why we are we are also talking to promotion bureau and they are advising Welcome to another session in the MBA Diaries, where we will be meeting an expert, uh, not just the national experts, but then of course the global veterans as well. So, as Asia Pacific Institute of Information Technology, we are honored to be hosting this webinar today uh, with another veteran in the global corporate world, and especially in a platform where we are talking about many discussions. and uh, national challenges international challenges ahead of us as sri lanka and as a nation as well so to start off let me warmly welcome all our students who are joining us from staffordshire university and from api sri lanka platforms and of course all our students who are joining us from different parts of the world as well in addition to that all our uh, delegates and diplomats who are joining us from all around the world and with that i would also warmly welcome all our partner universities who are on board with us as well so to start off with i would like to uh, thankfully invite dr rohan tatukorala who is one of our directors of api sri lanka and of course the pioneering um, leader who is initiating this networking sessions for all our students and whose initiative is uh, for mba diaries to take over the session introducing the speaker Uh, and uh, take over the session uh, forward dr rohanta over to you thank you kaushali and appreciate uh, so we have a fantastic personality today uh, he's a travel professional of over 30 years a managing director of wayfarers limited currently the president of the sri lanka inbound to operators association we call it more slito and uh, he represents the destination management company or dmc community of sri lanka he was the chairman of the organizing committee of the 2018 and 19 editions of sanchara kudava the largest travel and tourism fair held in sri lanka this fair creates the platform for all the small and medium stakeholders in the tourism industry to to come together and under one roof meet the local dmc community who is the primary client base um, for for sri lanka tourism he is an advocate for sustainable tourism chairman of the responsible tourism partnership for sri lanka and a trustee of the federation of the environmental organizations feo sri lanka uh, through these channels he has worked on multiple projects related to tourism 
conservation over the years. The beach operator or the beach boy training program carried out by the Responsible Tourism Partnership together with the Travel Foundation UK and the Nature Interpretation Program conducted for safari jeep drivers at the national parks. Uh, project run by FEO are some of the projects yes, involved on the hands-on basis. Together with the Travel Foundation of UK, through the Responsible Tourism Partnership and funding from the EU, he was directly involved in with the Greening Sri Lanka Hotels project back in 2010-2011. A unique position as a nature lover, conservationist, travel professional, and enables him to identify and work on problems related areas to tourism for sustainability. And he has conducted in sustainable manner the best practices to be excised across tourism destinations. He spends time getting involved in the education stakeholders of the importance and the benefits of creating sustainable tourism industry. So today we have a person who is absolutely ground-based, um, hands-on, uh, who works with the Jeep drivers, the tour guides, and, and the real people who come in contact with the, the, the visitors who come to Sri Lanka. So he's absolutely a ground-based person, which is why we have such a uh, lovely, eminent human being with us. Uh, President of the Sri Lanka Association of Inbound Tour Operators, Slito, Managing Director of Wayfarers Limited, ladies and gentlemen, Nishad Vijaytunga. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Rohanta, for all those nice things. Um, so basically, uh, Rohanta, are you going to be asking me questions or do I just box on? Um, uh, you could talk for a while, Nishad. Yeah. to give you, you know, the normal, uh, typical Nishad style of giving a whole overview. And, yeah. and then um, I'll take a few questions which come and I will share it okay. with you. Fine. So, um, right, hi, everybody. Thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, I don't need to, I don't want to go back and stress about how, how difficult things are or where we are at the moment, but believe in looking forward. So uh, right now, as far as the tourism industry is concerned, uh, it's an industry which uh, had the, had its best year in 2018. We generated around four and a half billion dollars across the industry. And uh, uh, we support, actually even now we support about 3 million livelihoods, which is about 13% of our entire the population of this. So we uh, unfortunately, uh, as you know, were hit in 2019 and then things started picking up. Then we got, then the pandemic came along and then that shut us down for about two years. And now when things started just picking up, we are faced with yet another crisis. But uh, having been in the industry for the last probably 30 years, uh, we've been through very tough times and we've been through ups and downs and uh, what is what is great about sri lanka is that it's a, it's a resilient nation and and we have lived through so many difficult times and we have always bounced back stronger and 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 better so we have uh, so the industry uh, i gave you a few stats about the industry uh, just to tell you a little bit about our association so actually Tourism is, uh, there are different stakeholders, as you know, there are the hoteliers and there are travel agents and within, I mean, the common term is a travel agent, but uh, this in the in travel agent community, there are two sides. There are the inbound people and the people who handle outbound tourism. Uh, that is the ticketing agents and things like that. Those are the guys who do, who are known as the outbound agents. So. The focusing on inbound agents or what we call DMCs, which stands for destination management companies. We are the ones who actually go out and, uh, and bring in the business or bring in the tourists. We promote the destination as a whole and we invest in, the, invest in promoting this destination and we, have, we bring tourists into the country. 
so we the slido uh, started uh, slido was um, initially uh, started off in 1975 we currently have a membership of around 240 dmcs in sri lanka uh, about 90% percent you will be surprised 90 to 95% of the dmcs are smes and not 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 big companies there are very few big uh, companies involved in inbound and so therefore the majority of our membership are small and medium enterprises so what we do is we uh, we partner with uh, we have uh, we partner with overseas travel agents or tour operators and and we bring in we bring in the tourists with the and we basically put together uh, the entire package that a tourist needs to do a, to carry on their holiday in in sri lanka so for example if somebody is coming here and they come through the dmc we will we will provide them their hotel we will provide them their transportation we will provide them the guides and then we will we will uh, run the entire trip for them and and they will go back uh, hopefully almost all the time with happy memories uh dm uh, so the dmc uh, industry in sri lanka i'll just give you a few stats we did some um, we did a eny did a did a project uh, actually a report in 2020 uh, based on the 2018 19 figures like i said 2018 was the best year in tourism for us and uh, based on that uh, it, it was uh, revealed that um, we bring in the tourism inbound tourism brings in around 2.2 billion in foreign exchange earnings and of this 2.2 billion around 1.5 billion is brought in uh, by slido members now i originally told you we bring in that the, the industry on its own is uh, creates creates about 4. Point, uh, that the recorded figure in 2018 was 4.5 billion so the 2.2 billion is directly just just the inbound tourism Uh, the inbound side of it where we bringing in the tourists uh, the rest of it is what the tourists would spend here and uh, and that's how the 4.5 billion gets made up and also there are clients who come directly and through other uh, online platforms and things like that so if you look at it that way you find still around 50% of uh, of the income is still brought in by the formal um, to operate a uh, community of this country um we basically generate around uh, 11200 odd jobs of course that at the moment is a bit low because uh, following the pandemic but like i said these are 2018 19 figures uh on when it comes to promotion and uh, uh, overseas promotion the tourism the the DMC community, especially even slight to membership, they spend around 1.53 billion per annum. That is a rupee figure on overseas promotion. And and what we do is we promote the entire destination. We don't. It's not like promoting one company or one hotel or one property. It's basically we promote the destination. We go out there and tell people to actually come in, come to Sri Lanka, and that's how that's that's the message we carry all the time. Uh, we are attend various tr- travel fairs uh, uh, across the world throughout the year then we do private meetings with with two operators overseas and and uh, like i said it's about 50% is brought in through this whole two operator uh, community and the dmc community in sri lanka uh, when it comes to uh, contribution to uh, hotel uh, the hotel sector around 62% of uh, of foreign guest nights or the number of room nights per hotel uh, about 62% of it per annum is provided by by the dmc sector whereas it's only around uh, 19 but i think this may increase a little bit now 19% on otas and the others are others are the direct sales and things like that that the hotel we do um, we contribute 11.5 billion uh, to the government coffers in terms of like i said we do the packaging so uh, in terms of 
uh, entry fees to the different sites, entry fees to the national parks, all of that stuff that we package together for the tourists. Uh, so paying all those entries and things, our contribution per annum is around 11.5 billion. And out of which 8.1 billion is the contribution of from the Slido membership. So that is about Slido and that is about the role uh, DMC plays in Sri Lanka. Uh, the way we see it now, uh, I mean, Ranta had asked me what I think uh, about um, the situation at the moment and isn't it a good, isn't it something good that has happened? Yes, there is some good in it. Uh, I'm not personal, personally speaking, I don't think uh, the message that went out on Bloomberg uh, by our president was a very, very positive one especially when you look at the markets, uh, generating markets for tourism to Sri Lanka and those governments, I don't think they view that very positively anyway. From a slight point of view, yes. From an industry point of view, yes. Thankfully, there is, there is some respite at the moment. We have, a, we have a fantastic minister in place and who's very receptive. And uh, also we have, uh, we have some really good people who have been installed as the uh, as heads of the different tourism uh, institutes like the Sri Lanka Tourism Development Authority, which, which is the regulatory authority for tourism, and the Sri Lanka Tourism Promotion Bureau, uh, which does the promotion for Sri Lanka tourism, and which is like the marketing arm. And also we have another marketing arm for conventions and uh, exhibitions and events, which is the uh, Sri Lanka Conventions Bureau. We have another new uh, chairman there. And of course, the Sri Lanka Institute of Tourism Hotel Management, which, which develops all the human resource for the industry. Uh, again, we have a, a, another chairman there, which I think uh, uh, it, is, it is a good thing to have four different people there who are focused on each of them and each of them are uh, experts in their, in their different um, fields. So that augurs well for the for the institute and and the function that they have to carry out. Um, so yeah, in that sense, thankfully we are in a slightly better place now. But having said that, uh, we still have the fuel crisis. We have the major thing, major problem for the tourism industry at the moment is the other actually the uh, travel advisories that uh, the Western governments have put in place. Uh, we have been talking to the different ambassadors and high commissioners about having these relaxed because there is, uh, at the moment, things are okay to some extent. But um, because it's 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 a it's a bit of a, a catch twenty two situation because uh, true uh, we are struggling. The, the the population here is struggling. We are we don't have fuel. We don't have sufficient fuel. We don't have sufficient gas. We don't have there's, there's food shortages predicted and all that. But uh, so obviously the, ex, the explanation or what the, the, what the foreign, foreign um, ambassadors and high commissioners are telling us is, you know, they don't want their citizens coming here and, and adding to this burden. But on the other side of the coin, the, at the moment we are, how we are managing to sort out these things to even this extent is by, by getting more aid, more help, more support. Whereas we, if we actually bring the tourists in who are willing to come, who are happy to come. And actually right now also, uh, yesterday we had a meeting with uh, Russian um, ambassador and he said at the moment he has 3000 clients, uh, 3000 Russian nationals in Sri Lanka as tourists at the moment. So, so if we get the how out from what what we are trying to say is if we bring those tourists in, then we bring in the dollars and the foreign exchange that we need to, to strengthen our economy. And the unique thing about the tourism industry is, uh, especially when you take the, when you take the uh, formal sector. So when you, what you call the formal sector is like these 240 DMCs and the registered hotels, anybody, any, any enterprise, any, uh, any, um, a hotel or BMC that is registered with the Sri Lanka Tourism Development Authority because we, we pay our taxes and we follow the rules and all that. So therefore, the entire 
uh, foreign exchange income that is earned is brought into the system through the through the uh, proper channels through the banking channels and that that definitely helps the economy at the moment as opposed to you know uh, other 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 ways that these money is coming which which is what the central bank is also now trying to stop so so that that is that is a major major thing that all of the money that we earn comes into the country uh, through the proper channels this is one industry where 95 at least 90 to 95% of what is brought in is retained in the country and also we have the we, there is a very uh, uh, there's a strong trickle down effect uh, where where the where the funds just trickle all the way down to from from uh, from the hotels down to the tour guides down to the uh, drivers to all the way down to the person selling tambili on the street and also uh, the guys who are supplying the uh, fish and meat and vegetables and fruit and everything to the hotels so so it has this trickle down effect that it it helps the um, rural economies as well because because of the when the tourists visit there then they will they buy buy things in those areas and things like that so that is that is the major uh, plus point in in the tourism industry that you know you ensure that the entire the, the funds actually trickle down and um, therefore so that is that is why we have been lobbying to try and see if they can relax these uh, the, the travel advisories because yes we will have problems but uh, if the tourists start coming in the funds will come in and that is probably the lowest hanging fruit at the moment in terms of the different uh, options that we have to earn uh, foreign exchange for the country as opposed to you know going with uh, going and uh, getting more aid and more uh, more help and support which definitely will have to will have to be there for a while until until we get out of the situation that we're in but but this is one of the ways that we can quickly uh, we can in the short term uh, bring in the foreign exchange that we need so uh, looking at it from uh, that point we have been working very closely with uh, with the new minister and also the new uh, heads of the institutions uh, there are plans afoot to um, to do a promotion in india um, towards the towards early next month we uh, traditionally uh, whenever we have had problems i mean one of the things i clearly remember is that uh, when when we had a attack on our airport the att attack on our airport and the airports were closed down and then that was that was actually in my uh, in uh, during my uh, career one of the first times i i i faced this problem where there were multiple uh, travel advisories and basically none of the two operators overseas were able to send send clients here and nobody could come here and uh, there were insurance problems and so basically it it was absolute no go situation and uh, at that time um, the only the way we kick back was uh, well it was india that came in the market indian market that came to our rescue uh, once things settled down and uh, they slowly started relaxing the advisories and with with promotions we we managed to get the indian market to come here and actually kick start the industry again so <clears throat> we did this even uh, soon after uh, towards the end of uh, last year when when things started working out there was one there was a promotion done sri lankan airlines came in they did a fabulous job they brought in bloggers they brought in uh, influencers uh, there were around i think 50 odd bloggers and top bloggers and influencers that were brought in and <clears throat> they were taken around the island with with slido and uh, and they did a, they they really created uh, the hype and uh, we saw a huge increase in the indian um, market in from the indian market and business did pick up a lot and of course then slowly the the other market started coming in like europe uk and uh, the other more mature markets that uh, used to that we are used to 
So, and then it, things did pick up. January, February, March was good. And then slowly from April, things started going pear-shaped again. Uh, so again, the way we see it, we have, uh, we have given as an industry, uh, the Hotels Association, Sri Lanka Association of Inbound Tour Operators, and also we have this other initiative, which is the One Industry, One Voice Initiative. And that uh, includes all the other, uh, you know, quite a few of the other associations like the Airline Representatives Association, the Colombo um, Restaurant Circle, and uh, also uh, the Travel Agents Association, then the, and, and they, so, several others who are also in this uh, because we work together and uh, we we uh, we discuss and we come we, we we try to resolve our different issues so we came together we gave a 17 point plan to uh, the the minister not a plan really the minister spoke to us and he wanted us to give him some uh, pointers which we did and uh, we are really happy that uh, quite a few of them have been taken on board and, and are being worked on right now. So I think this works well. So in that sense, I think we are behind on the right track at the moment. And hopefully uh, with, these, uh, with these promotions and things happening. And also if we, are, if we get, manage to get the travel advisories relaxed to some extent, then uh, I think we can slowly start picking up. Of course, uh, uh, the fuel and uh, gas situation will have to be resolved. Uh, there are promises that it has been made as far as the tourism industry is concerned. Uh, I know it, it may sound selfish on my part, but uh, because I'm also a citizen of this country, while we struggle sometimes for tourism vehicles and things like that, uh, we do get the fuel through the, uh, the transport board depots, which has been authorized by the ministry. So uh, that is also keeping in mind that you know bringing in the, bringing in uh, the tourists and bringing in, that brings in foreign exchange that will actually retain be retained in the country and in the in the system. So that that said, we are we are looking forward to uh, hopefully things getting resolved and um, and I am very I don't know I very confident and all of us because. Sri Lanka, we have gone through a lot of things, a lot of uh, bad times, ups and downs in the industry, and we have always come out. Uh, we have always come out uh, stronger and better, and uh, I know I'm quite confident that it will be the same after after this situation as well. So, if you want me to, if you want to ask me any questions, I'm happy to answer, and uh, that's about it from me at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nishad. And uh, it was fantastic how, without one single slide, how you went through the whole industry. Uh, I mean, it just tells you the kind of uh, um, uh, experience curve that you come from uh, over the years and the hands-on ground experience which you shoulder. Uh, is, is so true, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, we, 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 in today's world, what we have realized is that, uh, you know, the people who have very good street smartness um, is, is, is actually sometimes way above uh, the people who come from a typical university kind of a background. And uh, given the pandemic, uh, Nishad, we also realized that uh, you know, the whole, everybody's questioning these theories that have been developed because uh, all those theories have now changed because the consumer behavior has changed. So the, the way that the traveler would book a holiday would change, the things that they would do when they come to a country, the procedures they would follow uh, is so different that, you know, uh, having a person of your caliber um, talking, to, uh, talking about inbound tourism uh, is, 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 is really, a, uh, it's an absolute benefit to my mind uh, for a youngster studying for an MBA. Uh, just a few questions. I mean, there are so many questions coming across 
because your your flyer has been hosted in multiple platforms and um, so the first question coming out nishad is it says isn't this the best thing that could happen to sri lanka uh, what, what is your view uh, nishad can you put double spotlight niroshan when you yeah if you say what is isn't this the best thing well if you are talking about the current situation um yes i i guess i don't know whether it's the best thing but certainly we have got some breathing space we have got uh, the the situation could have been much worse but it it there's got some breathing space but like i said earlier i mean uh, i think uh, our current president going out on a, on a on a business network international business network and saying that uh, you know he's going to stick it out for while well, which when everybody is asking him to step down i mean it, I, i really don't know whether it will all go well with the with the international community and whether we will uh, be able to achieve everything however that is my personal opinion but from like i said industry side uh, i am uh, we are we are happy that we have got uh, some uh, fresh new start uh, with a new uh, minister uh with some with some with new uh, heads of the different tourism institutions who are focused on each of their roles and um yeah so that that org as well and that we think is 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 a good thing and that's why i was telling you about about what we are planning about the indian promotion and things like that and also on the other side we have been talking to the embassies about getting trying to get this uh the uh, advisory is changed which which is a must time and that if that doesn't happen then you know right now right now uh, uh, before before we went into this situation and even now our uh, bookings for july august which is the summer season in 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 europe and uk was very very healthy and it is looking really good so uh, there are a lot of cancellations coming in at the moment but that is because unfortunately uh, the two operators also need lead time at least 35 30 to 45 days lead time uh, to uh, to be sure that they can operate a particular trip so for example uh, if there's a trip that is planned and uh, 30 uh, 45 days 30 to 45 days before that trip if there is a travel advisory saying you can't go to that country then um, then that uh, sorry i mean that they only allow essential travel to that country then then what happens is these guys cannot operate, cannot um, keep that tour back on and also they then they have the tendency to suspend sales which affects the winter season which is always the best season in tourism i mean ranta you know you have been in the industry so uh, so so these are the these are the situations we are facing that is why i was harping on this thing about trying to have the or, or convincing the foreign governments that we desperately need as much as we are asking for aid and food aid and various things we also desperately need to get the tourists back into the country because nothing will happen if the tourists don't come into the country so in order to do that and especially through the formal channels it won't happen until the travel advisory is relaxed Sorry, I think Thanks. I strayed away from your question. No, no, no. We're very focused, Nishad. Very focused, because what you basically said is the ground reality. Yeah. And 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 I think you know, I think what the question talks about in terms of the best thing that this could have happened was that a lot of people are not looking at the reality, and and you know where where you quite very very frankly you put in. what are the exact challenges that are there you know those are those are the kinds of um, things that we don't hear because all this time we were listening to all the rosy picture stories you know i mean uh, for instance uh, you know you you had a our expenditure is about 3.1 trillion uh, for a year our income is only 1.6 trillion and uh, continuously year on year we have a huge deficit so we are actually um, um, living a 
uh, expenditure um, cycle where the the forecast the revenue doesn't come year on year so what people are saying is that the budget that has been declared for the last so many years is a wrong budget just imagine in our companies when you give a budget you know you are evaluated on a quarterly basis That's and it. if by chance you know your in income is not in line with the expenditure you know you are fired you know what i'm saying but here in the country what happens is we have got into a cycle where every year the budget is presented and every year the income is uh, lesser than the expenditure so at least today as we speak it has been brought to the limelight so now we will have to go through the pain of doing the reforms that have to be done uh, you know like the fuel increase i know it's not healthy but then on the other other hand what what research is showing richard is that if you look at the people who are absolutely owning and consuming the highest amount of petrol and diesel are the people who can actually afford to take a price increase even at 750 rupees a liter so you know these kinds of anomalies will have to be corrected even though it hurts and secondly of course we have a huge bloated private public sector uh, which you know we cannot afford to have so you know there will have to be reforms that will be brought in there and third happens to be that you have uh, this whole thing of you know the corruption that in the country is so high at every level that you know now at least people will look at the reality and say guys we let us do a job of work which actually adds value and not to look at the commissions which come in so you know from that light in a very transparent uh, manner nishad is you know what people are saying be the best thing that can happen to the country so that we recalibrate and then through that you know we make sure that in the next 10 years sri lanka comes out absolutely strong yeah. you know so the the next question that's coming in nishad is what do you think the potential we yeah, are this is coming from danushi who works for excite batteries and she is doing a masters uh, for staffordshire university she says what do you think the potential of tourism can be for sri lanka in the future right so potential of tourism i mean sri lanka is a blessed land we are really blessed with so much i mean rohanta you post all the time so you know exactly what we have and the beauty of this country the beauty of the landscape i mean we are truly truly blessed and i remember i mean i've uh, we've handled i mean i've handled a lot of clients in 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 my bit through my business and uh, one one and they, we always try and get some kind of uh, feedback uh, and there was this lady who 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 toured with her family and uh, one thing she said was that she was um, she she had traveled many times to india and uh, she took a chance coming here and she said she was amazed that everything that we are which we should have taken probably uh, years and years and many many holidays over and over again to india she just saw it in two weeks all compact in this in, in sri lanka and and she said she's still going to come back because she was so so taken up with what we have to offer so so we are truly blessed and and we have to uh as long as we 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 protect what we have and uh, and continue uh the potential is is uh, li- kind of limitless is not the right word but we need to manage it also because uh, sustainable sustainability is important and uh, in order to protect because at the end of the day what we are ma- what we are selling what we are marketing is a natural resource what the natural uh, what we have Uh, thank you thanks to mother nature and if we go and exploit them over exploit those places and thing and the uh, uh, the national parks the the various the waterfalls the rivers the whatever and then uh, you know if we go and ex- over exploit them um, then of course uh, we won't be able to do uh, carry out to market sri lanka for very much longer but i think over the years we i mean i have i've been in it now about 30 years but and i have seen some amount of um, exploitation but i can see now in the last 10 to 12 years 
uh, people are more and more conscious and even the Sri Lankans themselves are conscious and even the local companies, the DMCs are getting more conscious. They are, and and uh, what, what actually started off probably 15 years ago, uh, saying ecotourism, which was like a buzzword and nobody really knew what, what, they, what the meaning of it was. But actually it is more sustainable tourism and I think now more and more people are beginning to understand that if they don't practice uh, sustainable, I mean, if they don't have sustainable practices in their, in their, in their businesses, uh, especially in terms of the tourism industry, then of course, uh, it, uh, going forward, the, there'll be, uh, we, I don't think we can, we can last for, two, for very much longer. So therefore, I'm encouraged that people are actually thinking about it and, and, and carry, and practicing practicing it throughout uh, also the there are a lot of numbers that are talked about 5 million tourists 10 million tourists by such and such a year i don't think that is uh, yes we need to increase the numbers there is no doubt and also we have to we have to uh, entertain the entire cross section of uh, people or tourists starting from the absolute backpacker type low end student group all the way up to the high end people who because end of the day uh, it is it is the backpacker who will come here who will fall in love with this country and as they go through life and their careers uh, go through their careers and they uh, they uh, may, I mean they develop themselves they are the ones who will then come to the mid range and then eventually they'll come from the high range as well. So, so you have to cater to the entire cross section and, and, and we have to manage it. And we have, uh, especially our like places like, uh, Sigiriya, Yala, which are, which are, uh, which to an extent are over visited now, not at the moment, but if you took 2018, yes, it was kind of over visited. So we need to manage those things. We need to, actually do studies to see what is the carrying capacity that that particular location can have and what is the what is what is the optimum uh, carrying capacity we should uh, use and then we can limit those things and especially like even if you take things uh, places like Sigria, you can maybe advance the opening hour now it opens at seven maybe if you open, uh, advance it to say six o'clock or something there's still light and and if you take the tourism sector, tourists are more than willing to get up at five in the morning and then climb Sigiri at six because it's amazing to go up there and see the sunrise and things like that. So, so that way you can manage it. And then the local crowd comes mostly during the day. So, so, so like that, we need to, we need to uh, manage it. And if we manage it like that, the potential is, I would say, I don't know whether unlimited is the right word, but uh, yeah, in a sustained manner, it would be uh, unlimited. Um, Nishad, you're fantastic, uh, Nishad. I mean, you, 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 I don't know, maybe it's because of your 30 years of experience, but about two months back, uh, the UN approached, and, and right now we have just finished the carrying capacity study for Sigiriya. And uh, next week after next, actually, we are presenting it to all the stakeholders in Sigiriya. Uh, and that has four things. We have done the archaeological carrying capacity, that means how many is the optimum number of people can this rock uh, contain at a given moment. Then we have done the economic carrying capacity, which involves the whole community around. And yeah. then we have done a physical carrying capacity, which is physically how many people can stand on, on it. And, uh, and you know, uh, in terms of, you know, you very rightly mentioned there are four months uh, I think it was August, September, and January and February, where you know there was uh, there was too many people who had come. Right. And, July, uh, July, August, and uh, then uh, December through like mid December through through to end of March. March is also now very very uh, heavy actually. So four months was yeah. was it was too much, and and actually that particular four months we were above the carrying capacity. And, and it's so strange, uh, Nishad, because just one and a half kilometers from Sigiriya, you have Pidurangala. Yes. And it's such a beautiful, 
I mean, I, people don't go there much, but the scenery from Pidurangara is beautiful. I mean, it is, it's, it, I mean, it, I suppose somebody like you who looks at sustainability only will really appreciate. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. Do, do, you, do you feel, Nishad, since it's your 30 year experience, that there is a political view. Is there a political will to develop tourism? Or is it that they just talk, but they don't actually invest? I mean, we have had successive uh, governments coming and saying, we like to have a, a huge marketing communication campaign. And, and, and for the last three, four years, every year when it was just about to be done, some huge racket appears and ultimately it's taken off because you know, the, they want to earn some commission out of it. So do you think there's actually a will to develop tourism, uh, Nisha? Uh, I, I can't speak for politicians, but uh, we, have, we, have a, we have a huge uh, community in this industry who have given their lives to this industry and who have worked tirelessly over the years. And yes, we have. Uh, what you said is correct to some extent. The issue also partly is because of, uh, I think is the red tape uh, when it comes to government procurement and things like that. That is where, I mean, you you have been the chairman of the Tourism Development Authority and, and the Tourism Promotion Bureau. So, uh, so you know how difficult sometimes it is to get things uh, uh, worked out uh, because of the, though, so, even it, even though it is the destination management companies, the hotels, the restaurants, and everybody, and those those, uh, those uh, different businesses that are registered with the SATDA, uh, that actually bring in and we contribute one percent of our turnover as tourism development levy. I mean, this is thought out because uh, the first the first act for tourism was brought in 1968. And that was a very broad act. And there was one institute called the Ceylon Tourist Board and everything happened under that. The regulation was done by that the promotion of that. And there was not, the, 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 the funds were insufficient for actual proper promotions and things like that. And that is when some of our industry stalwarts at that time, they brainstormed. They, I mean, it took, I think, around 10 years until they really came up with this new legislature which was uh, enacted in 2005 and 2007 which is the current act number 38 uh, of 2005 uh, and and we and basically we uh, as an industry we volunteered we volunteered to contribute one percent of our turnover into a fund which can be used for uh, tourism promotion because tourism promotion always has to be done overseas so as a result it, it costs a lot of money it costs a hell of a lot of money and and the burden was too much for the for the treasury to keep dishing uh, you know giving out uh, funds like that so that is why the that was brought into that uh, into this act and uh, but uh, what happens is um, sometimes that's a sad thing spending that money uh, there are certain controls which have to be followed, which are the standard government uh, procedures and uh, uh, controls. So sometimes it, it it sometimes just doesn't work. And then, uh, so uh, like you said, then it comes up and then as you're about to launch, then the government will change, the heads will roll, and, and then the next person who comes in wants to do a whole different thing altogether. So anyway, I've lived through this, I mean, several, many times over and, uh, but we have managed and, and Sri Lanka has done pretty well for itself. I mean, 2018, we were on Lonely Planet and so many other uh, platforms. We were ranked among the top uh, destinations to visit. And, and that has, of course, that has partly been organic as well, because people have been coming here, going back and especially with social media platforms and all that taking over. Uh, so, so we have to have, uh, I feel that with the right people in the right place, then definitely there is a will to, to do it. But like I said, I can't speak for politicians and hopefully, but I can, at the moment, the minister we have in place, 
he himself says he's not sure how long he'll be the minister, but at least he's committed and and he's even even privately he's like uh, saying you know I'm going here if you want me to speak to somebody uh, some of your agents I'm happy to talk to them I'm happy to assure them of what's going to happen here and blah blah so that kind of stuff so so that's all good and I I I, I mean um, yeah so to give you a direct answer to your question I I don't know about political will but certainly the my my colleagues in the industry both in tourism in the hotels and everything are very committed and we have stuck in our industry for the last 30 years like over the 30 40 years some have more than 40 50 years also but uh, we're stuck in the industry because we have faith in our country we have faith in in tourism and in the industry here uh, there's a good question coming from a brandix guy uh, Gayan, he's also doing the masters at Staffordshire University, uh, Nishad. He's yeah. saying, what particular reforms would you would you like tourism to have? Tourism, uh, when you talk about reforms, uh, there are a lot of things talked about. But the way I see it, uh, we have to we have to look at a model that. Uh, that can, I mean, we have this massive fund, right? We have this massive fund which is sitting here, and uh, and we are still struggling to spend it uh, on things we have to spend it. So that is one of the main, I would say, the main things that we need to look at is uh, how uh, to bring in a different. Um, I don't know whether it's bringing in a different. Uh, structure or whatever to the tourism promotion bureau where they'll have more you know uh, leeway to to actually spend these monies on proper promotions and things like that uh, rather than the situation that we are faced with i mean i'm not criticizing anybody or anything but um, i think we need to i mean some of these uh, i think some of these um, what do you call the, the the government regulation on spending and things like that i think is some of them is some of them are pretty archaic so so and also i mean if you look at even some some of the fines and all that we have to pay i mean it's a joke so i really so so therefore i think overall we need a need to look at uh, those those kind of things being relaxed and and people who know the industry who understand the industry need to be put in the places where they can take decisions and box on with, with promotion. So that's, that, that is what I would really like to see. Ruanta, I think you're muted. Uh, the, sorry, uh, the question coming from Hansani. She works for the ITBP of industry. Uh, She's asking, uh, what made you like the tourism industry? And especially, uh, can you tell us uh, one of your flagship sustainability projects that you think you would like to share with us? Uh, from the time I was a kid, my father encouraged us. We traveled a lot all over the country. I mean, not overseas. Huh? And... Uh, Every holiday, we did some trip or the other. Earlier, it used to be to some friend's D estate or somewhere else or to the to some jungle or the other. I, I love going to the jungle. I mean, I, I can go and spend days and days inside the national parks and I really enjoy that, uh, doing that. So, so from the time I was a kid, we did a lot of traveling. And then I remember when uh, the Mahavali project started in the late 70s, uh, every school holiday, the trip was some educational type of trip where we were taken to, I mean, he, my father managed to um, find somebody who we knew from somewhere in some Mahavali project or the other, and then we would be taken to see, uh, see the project and how, and then we'll be given a rundown on how it's going to operate and all of that. So, so this traveling bug, the travel bug has been in me for the longest time. Uh, but actually how I got into tourism is actually quite quite uh, 
quite a chance thing. Um, I remember, so eventually when I finished, I actually started life. I, those days, there were not a lot of universities and stuff. I never went to university, but I did go to uh, the NIBM uh, Institute of uh, Business Management. Had a, had a, uh, they had a course in computer systems design. And then you would come out as what they call the systems analyst at that time. And, uh, and that was, that was what I, the path I chose, uh, not, not, not entirely because I wanted to, but with pressure from my parents as well. And I did that and I, and, and then I started working in IT and I got quite bored actually sitting in front of a screen, even though now that's what I do most of my life in front of a screen. But at, in those days, in the early eighties, it was, I mean, it was not so much fun sitting in front of a screen, but anyway. And then, um, what happened was uh, I still used to travel. I used to still go around con the country. I used to go to national parks to do all that stuff. And then eventually, uh, even even when it came to work, I would jump at any posting I'll get out of Colombo. So I have I work for a property development company in there, and then I I worked in Kandy. I worked in Matra and all of these places. So it was fun. And then when I after when I got married, my wife's brother had started. Wayfarers back in 1976. And uh, my wife was also working for Wayfarers. And then eventually, uh, we got after I got married, and then uh, we had our first, uh, my, I have three sons when we had the first of my, of our children. Uh, my wife was still working, but then my brother-in-law decided to migrate to Australia. That is in, I think, uh, late 80s. And um, I thought, and, and then they were discussing, should they close the company down? Because my wife said, look, with kids, I can't be doing this on my own. And then my brother-in-law once caught me and said, hey, listen, this is kind of an established business. I know this is not the greatest thing, but why don't you, why don't you look at, you know, doing this and, uh, you know, uh, take it on. So having the travel bug in me anyway, and also by that time I had kind of realized that I would like to do something on my own rather than, you know, working for somebody else. So, so this was like a fun thing. And, and, and then, uh, I, I anyway was helping my wife on the side while I was doing a job, I was working for Celtel at that time. And then, um, then quite, then that's how I eventually got into the tourism industry. And, and, and this is, this is a fantastic industry. I know everybody who's in the e individual industries you say that that is a fantastic industry but this is an amazing industry because this industry actually it the whole thing grows on you once you get in you can't it's very difficult to get out and and it's a it's a fun industry because end of the day you're sitting there in your office uh planning holidays for other people and 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 sending them on those holidays and then uh, you you part of your job is to actually your research is actually going on holidays and, and figuring out, you know, what is out there and what you can do and how you can, you know, market those products and what are the odd things. Now you were talking about Pidurangal. I mean, uh, Yala was another place that I, I felt was highly over-visited. And uh, I managed uh, the, the, the companies that I work with, which are mostly my, my company works with UK-based companies. We were one of the first to pull out of Yala because we felt it was irresponsible going to Yala. And we started, we started instead going to Vilpattu. Uh, some of our tours, we don't climb Sigiriya, we climb Pidurangal. So, so those, are, those are the little things that from a sustainable point of view, what we do. So, so yeah, so that's how I got into the tourism industry. And I don't think I would have done anything different. I really, really enjoyed this. And um, yeah, and, and it's been a fabulous, 30 years, I'm a member of the day. Uh, and no intention of retiring anytime soon. So You can't because you are the president of Slido now. Is there one key project you like to share on sustainability? And, and, and explain because uh, most of these uh, on the MBA program, uh, they're uh, in the apparel industry, they're in the ITBPO industry. Um, uh, they are also into fast-moving consumer goods. Uh, we have one or two in the tourism. 
but uh, on the sustainability side, you know that it's one of our key concerns. Uh, can you share some uh, some one good? Yeah. So, so right now the the sustainability projects that I'm involved in are mostly uh, through the FEO, the Federation of Environmental Organizations. Uh, one of the first projects we did, and that time we didn't have much funding, but we 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 did it on our own. We realized that we had to do something uh, to have discipline in the national parks, and uh, also to educate uh, educate uh, the drivers who take tourists in there and all that because you know that for the sustainability of the park itself. So uh, with um, uh, uh, one of the one of uh, with a team headed by actually. Uh, Dr. Sumit Pilapiti, who's who's a renowned uh, environment uh, elephant researcher and former World Bank and all that. I mean, we we went and did this on. I mean, voluntarily went went into Vilpatu. We had the support of the Department of Wildlife Conservation. They they were very supportive and and they they were, they allowed us to go and do this training in Vilpatu. And and even to date, if you go into Vilpatu, you find that the madness that you find in Yala with the drivers, how they reverse, how they, you know, break, how they creep through. Mm -hmm. You don't find that in Vilpatu. We trained over 1,260 odd drivers in Minneria, Kaudul area. Of course, by, by, by the time we got to that, because we did Vilpatu with our own personal funds and things like that. When we got to uh, Minneria, uh, the Tourism Development Authority at that time, uh, also understood the, the the need and they they funded the program so so it was and and of course the wildlife department gave us the facilities to do it there and and we trained and uh, and even now the the feedback we get was that quite a few of these uh, they still don't have the madness that you get in yala unfortunately we didn't never got to yala because again like i said the 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 heads changed and then the pandemic came and then everything kind of went bad shaped. Otherwise, the plan was to do Udavalave after that and then to do uh, Yala after that. That That is one of the projects that I really enjoyed. And um, Dr. Sumit used to actually explain in detail uh, about elephant behavior or if it was in Vilpatu about uh, we had another gentleman uh, who's an expert uh, Nama Kamagura, who was an expert on leopards, who, who, oh, okay. who used to explain on about the leopard behavior. So what we did was actually the mentality of these drivers was if you go in, you had to show them either elephant or a leopard. Otherwise, you know, you won't get a tip, you won't get this, you won't get that. And and this is what was being plugged by the tourist drivers and people also. So what, what we did was um, we, and then we also had uh, in in uh, environmentalists who had specialized in those areas, like for example, in Min area, we had a lady. Unfortunately, I can't remember her name. She knew the geography of that area extremely well and how the how the rivers flowed, how the streams flowed in the direction, what and the seasons, how it happened. So as a result, we were able to give these guys uh, the knowledge. What we called it was not a training; we called it a nature interpretation program. And we gave them the knowledge to to interpret any situation, any uh, in the park, or you know, so that when they drive in, they don't have to go tearing to show a leopard or a, or an elephant. They can even stop by a tree and spend uh, spend ten minutes explaining about that tree or something like that, and give that knowledge. So, when we started off, I still remember in Min area, the drivers were not very keen to come, and they were like, you know, we don't need this. You know, we've been doing this for generations, and blah blah. But the DWC then made it mandatory and said, if you guys don't follow this and get the certificate, you won't be allowed into the park. And then the comments we got after the two days of training, like they used to talk amongst themselves and say, oh, we actually learned something, no? And this is amazing, no? About how that elephant behaves this way or how, how, uh, how this sound that the elephant makes, this is what it talks about. And then we even, uh, Actually, Sumit had uh, slides where he showed if you are driving on this lane, 
you know, park this way, don't, you know, uh, if you do this, then you'll be blocking the elephant's path and things like that. So that was a really enjoyable thing that I did. And uh, long time back, that is, I think, 2010-11, the, the Beach Boy program. I mean, um, Beach Boys, what the people we used to call Beach Boys, I mean, it's not a nice word to use at the, uh, right now, but I'm just saying that what it was those days. Traditionally, tourism in the 60s, when it started, uh, there were these uh, areas that were demarcated, you know, like Bentota Bay Dweller, and those are yeah. resort areas. And immediately what happened, like everything else, like the big companies, uh, the conglomerates, they went in, bought land, because they were the ones who had the money to do it, and they built these hotels. And immediately, there were parapet walls that went up right around the hotels, and everybody in the area was kept out, and they did their little thing within. And no one from the uh, from the community benefited from from tourism at that time. So that that created a very hostile environment there, and uh, that is why they eventually ended up being beach boys because these guys couldn't take the the, the hotels couldn't take over the beach. The beach in front of them was public. Anybody could go there, and then there were these clashes between the hotel management and the uh, and the, uh, the beach boys. They were clashing because they were, you know, uh, creating a situation where they would they would be talking to the tourists and harassing the tourists and things like that. So we identified this problem, and what we did uh, because it was then soon after the war finished and things were picking up, and with the support of the Travel Foundation UK and the Travel Foundation UK was set up by uh, the then Prime Minister Tony Blair, and uh, the purpose of it was to give back to the communities that the British tourists visit. And luckily, Sri Lanka got picked as one of the first uh, beneficiaries of this uh, project. And then we created this situation, and what we did was we went in there, uh, spoke to the beach boys, explained things to them spoke to the hoteliers, brought the two communities together, and and then we they were renamed, I mean, not, they were called, they were then after that called beach operators, and we encouraged them to to actually develop uh, little, little industry things that they can do, like, say, for example, take a tourist on, I mean, if they had some nice, uh, you know, place to show them down, like in a river, or, or some uh, little spot of jungle or something, or point out and do a walk or something like nature walk kind of thing and you know that kind of thing and also without only focusing on selling some piece of cloth or some handicraft or something yes that was also there and then what we did was we uh, we encouraged them the the hotel management to take on x number of uh, guys from from the village to be to be in front of the hotel mm. so so for example hotel a would have uh, say 10 people and within amongst the 10 they would roster themselves and then you would you don't find a huge number of fellows hanging around outside when the tourist comes up mm. like that we created and then the guys who are in in front of hotel b won't come and poach on the guys in hotel a and you know so that took a lot of uh, a lot of uh, training a lot of uh, talking a lot of explaining and you know and i think that was that was just even even uh, the travel foundation uh, for the longest time i think still on their website that is one of their flagship projects that they still talk about so being i mean being a part of that was was amazing and and it was really good and uh, i i happened to go to some of those uh, at the at the end of the program we would give them t-shirts, we would give them a, what do you call a certificate and, you know, uh, empower them, empower them to be in that position. And when you go there, you know, I still remember one, one of, some of these guys, they used to come and thank me, thank me. And I said, listen, this is nothing to do with me. I just came here. I'm only part of the organization. They said, na, 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 me, api, 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 in Sinhalese, if I can explain what he said is, you know, we were not taken any notice of in our village, but by this program, we have been given a new lease of life and they actually look up to us and they think that we are now doing something uh, 
responsible and 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 good uh, whereas i mean what we are doing is pretty much what we used to do but in a more organized way but still you know so so that was a really great project that we did and i think uh, yeah that was that is a good project I mean, yeah i actually i i would encourage uh, one of the mba students to do this project on the beach boys and the one that you talked about in ya in vilpattu yeah. uh, to be to do it for their dissertation so that it could be captured and and then subsequently the best practice could be uh, shared and documented nishad so let's see how i could maybe man, uh, convince uh, a set of youngsters to do this because it's it's really fantastic i mean I, this is real uh, top end doctoral work uh which which a lot of people don't understand you know uh it's a science you know like what oh, you yeah, did in, yeah i mean what what you just now shared in vilpat to to look at you know like what dr philipita was sumit was talking about on the behavior of an elephant how do you park you know and then you know when we go to yala we tell the driver you know the first thing we say is other uh, uh, Komari koti ek open na no ni. What I'm saying, and he goes all over the countryside, calling all his friends, trying to see where this fellow is. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, so though tourism, tourism is blamed for all of this. Uh, we what we find, I mean, I I have served on committees where we have looked at how to manage this thing. Uh, we find that it is it is the it is the locals who are the biggest uh, yeah. uh, culprits in this whole operation, and uh, you know, I mean. and i remember in in the in those days when we didn't have we were not conscious of all these things i mean i i probably would have done the same thing a long years ago so so i mean we need to look at it differently and we need to try and see how we can you know there's a interesting question coming from shamila uh she's also on the mba program nishad she's asking if there are travel advisories it means that people can't come uh because if they are going to come the insurance premiums are going to be higher or sometimes they might even not get premiums so how does the industry how can the industry survive so yeah so that's what i'm saying i mean it's it's very difficult to survive it's like this now if you talk to uh, the uh, what do you call uh, those who the the different countries they will say look we are not telling anybody not to go but then moment you put bring in a travel advisory saying that uh, only essential travel or there is a re- high risk or something like that then obviously like the the insurance premiums would go up and things like that uh, on one side so so actually for the formal sector what we call the formal sector is like uh the like the dmcs hotels and all that which are registered with tourist board who bring in all our funds in blah blah all of that then you get the organically developed informal sector where you know people book through various platforms somebody has turned their house into a into a homestay or into a guest house and you know like typical if you look at places like uh, unavatuna all giris uh, those are all places that have organically kind of developed into into informal into through the informal sector so now those people uh, people like that have no issues they they still come as long as the airport is open and there are flights uh, they will come because they do their own bookings and come so that way actually for the informal sector to some extent the uh, what do you call uh, country is open Uh, yeah no no country is open and 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 uh, like if now if you go to l it's packed with uh, tourists the thing is that, so so the smaller smaller guys in the industry they actually benefit from that whereas uh, whereas unfortunately for us it's tough so yeah so that's why now more, most of the time what we what we are always trying to do is to to talk to these people and try to get these uh, um advisories uh, relaxed but similarly there are there are other ways of surviving because you take countries like india middle east and all there are no advisory so that's why we are we are also talking to the promotion bureau and we are advising i mean if you can not advising but encouraging them to do promotions in those countries because those are actually the lowest hanging fruits at the moment to to as far as tourism into sri lanka is concerned nishad um 
lovely chatting with you. Yeah. One last question. Thank you so much for spending almost one and a quarter hours. Uh, I, I actually said only 45 minutes, but it's lovely uh, listening to you, uh, you know, talking about real hands-on uh, tourism um, uh, experience and, of course, conceptualizing it to uh, uh, fantastic theories like sustainable tourism and, you know. So, um, uh, uh, Richard, what is your advice to a youngster who is uh, like um, kind of... Um, uh, 24 years old, doing a master's. Uh, why is he doing a master's? Because he wants to move up the corporate ladder. And then, you know, he gets up in the morning and he sees all these kind of things on the media, you know, 21st Amendment, you know, the kinds of unruly behavior in parliament. And then, of course, you know, the reforms are not happening. Uh, you know, but, but of course, you have seen this over time in the last 30 years. You're, you're a very seasoned, mature person. What advice would you give a 24-year-old youngster, Nishad? First and foremost, I'd say have faith in Sri Lanka. And uh, qualify yourself um, in your chosen field. And uh, I mean, I have three boys. I, all I've told them throughout is just whatever you do, do the make sure you you know in in your heart and your head that you have done 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 it to the best of your ability. So that that's what you need to do, and then after that everything else will fall into place. And uh, yeah, education, especially now, is very important, and uh, you you should you should uh, follow follow. I mean, if you're following career path, yes, you need to progress both with experience as well as with uh, with education and uh, and it's a good thing but have faith in sri lanka sri lanka is a fabulous country uh, i actually when uh, suna like i i mentioned earlier when after my brother in law migrated to australia uh, there was a lot of pressure on my wife and i before we had kids for us also to come and it looked very rosy at that time because we were going through a JVP insurrection here. We had a, uh, we had a, uh, that, that's a second JVP insurrection. Plus we had the war in the north, and and even tourism was not doing well. I mean, it was just you know just managing to move along. But um, I don't know something. I think that I needed to go, and and I'm glad. I'm happy. I stayed. We 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 raised a family, three 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 kids, and um, yeah, there were some days. It was really worrying because when the kids went to school, you don't know if they'll come back. But in spite of all that, I mean, uh, there is no place like here. I have traveled a lot on work, on whatever, and I know a lot of family who live overseas. Sometimes when you go and stay with them and all, and you see the life they lead, and you know what you have here, all the money in the world can't buy, buy what we have here anywhere else in the world. So it's very artificial, it's very this thing. And, and here, our just our natural environment alone is, is, is amazing. So have faith in Sri Lanka and, and remain in Sri Lanka and do what you can for your country. And the country will give it back to you, I mean, uh, over and over again. So, so yes, do study and, uh, and have faith and box on. That's what I have to say, actually. Thank you very much, Nishad. Uh, I mean, we have had a lot of speakers coming in from different walks of life, ambassadors, chairmen of multinationals. Uh, yeah, I mean, you have different cross-sections of people, but this is the first time we are having a hands-on, uh, practical uh, person from the tourism in industry. And uh, I mean, what you shared today, uh, you know, is, 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 is real hands-on, uh, fantastic. Um, ground-based, uh, which we never heard of. Uh, thank you very much, Nishad. And ladies and gentlemen, that is president of the uh, number one organization for bringing down tourism to Sri Lanka, the Sri Lanka Inbound Tourist Operators Association, Slito, we call it. Uh, Kaushali, over to you, Kaushali. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rohanta, for inviting me. And it was a pleasure. And uh, I hope I have convinced at least a few of your 
uh, MBA students to remain in this country because at the moment the brain drain is uh, yeah. is worrying actually. Thank you very much. Kaushali. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nishad. Indeed, it was uh, very hopeful to be listening to you, especially in a time where we are looking forward to have that hope instilled in youth. So with that ex experience sharing session, we come to the end of another session. Uh, with all this, as we always say, information, knowledge that you can't just take in another textbook. So thank you for that information that is uh, shared with our students today. And with that, we come to the end of this session and we'll meet back again in another week. Until then, do take care and stay safe. Good night. Thanks, Dushan. Thanks, Kaushali. Thank you.